um, Jamie, uh, what did you talk about at the Forum uh, d'Avignon this morning? Well, um, I was asked to talk a little bit about the uh, world of intellectual property, and the question was very French and very abstract. Intellectual property, is it a universal value? And so I talked about the three agendas that I saw competing for today in the for hearts and minds in the IP world, the first being the enforcement agenda, which is basically the idea that we want um, pretty much a level of control that varies inversely with uh, uh, ease of copying. So as copying uh, becomes very easy, uh, very cheap, we want basically perfect control. Um, so we want perfect control on the one hand, and this belief that the more rights we meet means more innovation. And I said that that was sort of dominating a lot of the discussions, a lot of the international debates. Then I said there's the development agenda, so they're very much based on human need, the idea of access to medicines, access to books, and so forth, an attempt to sort of recall IP to its goal of producing innovation, but expressed in terms of human needs rather than in terms of this assumption of this model. And then I sort of introduced a third, which I called the boring agenda, which the, was simply the boring agenda. The boring yes. agenda. And the boring agenda was uh, very modest and had three, three components. The first is that um, intellectual property rules should be made openly and democratically, unlike um, tr uh, non-transparent processes like ACTA or like the Trans-Pacific Partnership Agreement, where the text of the treaty itself is classified, which seems utterly ludicrous. The second is that intellectual property should be based on empirical evidence, not lobonomics, but actual empirical evidence, uh, where we would actually be humble about our ability to predict whether or not we need more rights or not. And the third being the notion that there needs to be balance between rights and limitations, openness and control, and it's the balance, not the control, that produces the innovation. And I said, unfortunately, you're not going to uh, hear very much about the boring agenda because, to be honest, most politicians never encounter it. They never encounter the idea that intellectual property rights are politically disputable. They never encounter the idea that there's a role for users or for citizens in discussing them. They never encounter the idea that it's a policy that can be assessed based on evidence. And they never encounter the idea that the limitations are as important to the system working as the rights. So I attempted to make those points in a very few number of minutes, and I think um, it went over relatively uh, clearly, and I think it was largely ignored in the rest of the, uh, the, rest of the discussion. Well, I'm sorry to say though, that I agree with you on both points. You were, <laughs> you were incredibly clear, and it was wonderful to hear you. And then it, the conversation continued as it had. There was a there's a fourth um, uh, framework that, um, t to my ears, kept coming up, um, including President Sarkozy when he spoke here, which is that there is a moral right, and not in the European sense of moral <laughs> rights, but that it's my property mm -hmm. and you're, you should never be allowed to steal my yes. property. Yes. Uh, and that seemed to me to be, although much of the discussion was economic, mm -hmm. um, it seemed to me that was often very brought forward so. as, uh, in any case, how can you steal from me? Yes, very much uh, so. That, that um, I, I talked a little bit about that. There's an assumption in France uh, that there's the French tradition of the droit d'auteur, and that the, this is very right different. The yeah, yeah, the right, the right of the author. But it, but it really means something different than copyright in our sense. Copyright in our sense, an instrumental system, utilitarian system, which can be judged according to its incentives. We're giving rights to the author not because we value him or her, but because we say we want to encourage the next author, the next producer of culture. Um, the French system obviously saying it's part of my human right, and it's part of the expression of my personality, uh, and so this is truly mine. And so it's assumed often by the French, I think, that their system is very different and that when Americans talk about limitations and exceptions and judging by evidence that they're being very foreign to this and instead the idea should be total control. And I talked a little bit about the origins of the French droit d'auteur uh, right after the French Revolution. There was this very big debate in France about whether there should be, as they called them then, literary privileges. Um, some people saw this as merely uh, one of the human rights that the Declaration of the Rights of Man and the Citizen would represent. Others saw it as state control of speech. And uh, I actually sort of foregrounded the debate between Diderot and Condorcet, who went at this from opposite sides. Diderot saying there must be total, perpetual, and easily alienable rights to authors, which can then be very easily acquired by publishers. He was working for publishers. And Condorcet says exactly the opposite. He says every time you make a literary privilege, you are telling one man he may not speak words that he wishes to speak. The question is, does human enlightenment require us to make that trade-off? It sounds like Jefferson. It sounds like Macaulay. And it's right there in the debates. And my point was, in the end, the French get neither Diderot or Condorcet. They get a mixture. And it's still a mixture. There are limits to any system, to the American system, to the French system. And as soon as you're talking about limits, copyright stops here. This is fair use. This is parity. This is permitted. As soon as you're talking about limits, you have to be talking about limits in some sense where you're saying, should we have the limits here? And then you have to get into a utilitarian discussion. Because there's nothing in the notion of the rights of author that's going to tell you how long they should last, 
what the exceptions should be, whether or not parity should be permitted. These are things you have to decide based on uh, effects in the world. <coughs> and finally, uh, how much of that discussion of balance and limits did you find at this meeting? I think that it was a, a competition to declare how much we all hated piracy. Um, I think there were a number of things going on. One was a, a fascinating conflation of Google with the internet. <laughs> so if piracy went on the internet, it was Google's fault. And so Google is not the internet. So there was that sort of trope where Google became the internet. The other thing was this assumption that total control... Which, by the way, I think is an indication that this, uh, this meeting, anyway, thinks of the internet as a pile of content. Yes. Uh, think about yeah, it absolutely. As and and, and your, your writing obviously you know, suggests otherwise, as, as I think does mine. The idea of linkage, that the, the web is about the links, it's about the connections that human beings built, because we are human beings and that's what we do, we build connections. That it really escapes here. The idea that that's what Google captures, that they capture the architecture of the web through our links, is again not seen. I think you're absolutely right. It's indexing content in a sort of encyclopedist manner rather than dealing with a social web. So and that's absolutely correct. Absolutely correct. Um, Diderot raises his head again. Yes, Diderot raises his head again, the encyclopedists. <laughs> and I mean, not that I'm, you know, the French encyclopedists yeah. have much to teach us, Absolutely. but not, I think, how to understand the web. So I, I think that that, it was a problem, and it was a problem where a number of things, um, pride, legitimate pride in French culture, concern about globalization, get mixed in with a debate about the future of technology, and people can't understand the trade-offs between freedom and openness on the one hand, and control on the other, and the assumption is more control would be better, and one of the questions I asked at the very end of the meeting is, if you had the world in which you had the level of control you say you want here, it wouldn't be the internet. It would be Minitel. <laughs> that was a wonderful point. And Minitel <laughs> was not a good thing. Um, there was very little piracy on Minitel. There was also almost no creativity. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dick.